Thank you very much. Uh, first to Declan and Dennis for telling all those lies about me. I want to thank Declan Kelly, who's done a really wonderful job as uh, the Secretary of State's envoy to Northern Ireland. Hillary's always did have good taste in men. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> and I, <clears throat> I want to thank uh, my friend Dennis O'Brien. Uh, most of you know this, but Dennis has an enormous uh, piece of the cell phone business in Haiti. And when we first met, he said, you know, those kids on the street in Haiti, they're among the poorest kids in the world, and they may be the best entrepreneurs who work for me. And I say that because one of the things that you know in your bones if you're Irish and you've been raised in the stories of Ireland is that intelligence and ability are evenly distributed, but opportunity and the breaks of life are not. More than any other international business person operating there since that earthquake and before, for more than a year before, he has headed our working group uh, through the Global Initiative, laboring to rebuild the economy of Haiti and hauling other people from around the world down there and making them make similar commitments. Uh, someday that country will be whole for the first time. And when it is, you'll deserve a lot of the credit. Thank you. Um, I, <clears throat> Ian Highland, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for quoting the best lines from Seamus Heaney I ever quoted. Oh, I love that book, The Cure at Troy, that poem. It's unbelievable. And you should all read it if you haven't. It ought to be required for Irish citizenship. <laughs> I'll say more later, but I'm glad that Seamus Heaney and his wonderful wife, Mary, are here. UCD President Hugh Brady, thank you for being here. Lionel Alexander, thank you, uh, and thank you for your wonderful remarks. Karen McLaughlin, the President of Worldwide Fund, thank you. And Loretta, thank you for always being there for the links between Ireland and the rest of the world, and especially the American diaspora. I was actually asked today at a, an appearance of the institute that, under the leadership of your former Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern, was named for me at UCD. I met with the students and answered their questions. And one of them actually asked me, now 15 years after the Irish ceasefire and after the peace process is complete, is it important for us to keep up our ties with Irish people around the world and especially in the United States? And I said, uh, I think it's more important than ever. And if I didn't think that, within 15 minutes, Loretta would convince me it was true. <laughs> so I thank you. The first thing I would like to say to all of you tonight is that the Irish are known by some as sharp traders, but I have to say that I have always gotten so much more out of this relationship than I have given to it. I will present you a metaphor. This is Seamus Heaney's newest book. I'm trying to sell it, I get a small commission. On it. <laughs> Here's the deal. He inscribes his books to me and I named my dog for him. <laughs> Pretty good deal, don't you think? Every Irish person I know is like that. They're always giving me more than I could possibly give back. I would like to just say a, a couple of words about the meeting Declan and I had in Northern Ireland yesterday <clears throat> and the conversations I've been having today. Most of the time when people talk about the Irish, they talk about the heart, the hope, the heartbreak, the madness of the past, the difference in the future. 
the emotional content of the poetry and the music. I'll never forget how I gasped the first time I met, I read uh, Yeats's poem, Easter 1916, by that one simple line, too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. I've memorized huge sections of Seamus's poetry. That moved me. The Cure at Troy is most moving because it's the story of uh, the Trojan Wars version of Nelson Mandela, the great archer Philoctetes and his magic bow and how he was abandoned by Ulysses on an island for 10 years with his foot injured and Ulysses thought he would die and he didn't die. Instead, he just had a horrible stump. But they never lost when they had his bow. And before the final surge that resolved the conflict, Ulysses took a young man with him back to the island to try to get Philoctetes to come with them. Since he knew Philoctetes doubtless would hate his guts, he sent the boy up there to put a false story on him, hoping to lure him into the boat and take him off. But Living alone on an island for a decade does things to your sensitivities, and he realized he was being conned, and so Ulysses had to come up, tell the truth, apologize, and beg him to come and save the fate of his people. And he does. He forgives him, and he comes. He leaves. And it's a beautiful story how he forgives him. Hope rises up. Hope and history rhyme. They go off to make history. But to me, the most lovely thing, almost 15 years ago, 15 years ago, 1st of December, I quoted that whole section in Derry in the square, and there were 25,000 people there. Seamus was here, saw it on television, came over to the American ambassador's house that night when I came down from Northern Ireland and had copied out the section I quoted and then quoted the line that's most important of all for me today and signed it. And that letter he wrote me is framed and hanging on my wall at home in New York. But here's what the line is. So Ulysses gets him in the boat, all's forgiven, they're gonna go off and win a great battle. And this man who has not bathed or shaved in a decade who's, who's leg is turned to mush, but who still has his bow and can shoot it, looks back at this godforsaken rock that he has spent a decade on and says, it was a fortunate wind that blew me here. Why? Because it made him a bigger, better, fundamentally different person. Why does the whole world adore Nelson Mandela? Why do I every single year in the month of his birthday try to make sure I'm in South Africa to be with him, even though it is a very long way? Because we cannot imagine spending 27 years in prison, giving up our best years, having it cost us seeing our children grow up, having it ultimately destroy a marriage, being subject to physical and emotional abuse, and finally letting go of all that hatred. And so just liking him and admiring him makes us all feel like we can't be all bad. Must be something redeeming about us all. The world we live in <clears throat> has a lot of good stories. You heard it in what has been said here about the history. The world we're living through now, the, which has turned out to be absolute hell for some people, has the dark underside. It is good to have a market, not good to turn it into a gambling house. It is good to give people freedom in exchange, not good for that to be abused. It is good we can all afford to be here and have a nice life. Not good if our prosperity comes at the price 
of crushing rather than expanding the dreams of most people just to be in the middle class, to escape their poverty, to educate their children, to make their kids believe that they can have a better life than they did.